Greetings, everyone. My name is Grace Berryhill, and I am a senior technical information scientist at the Jackson Laboratory. And it's my pleasure to present this presentation for you entitled Predictive Preclinical Oncology Studies Using Patient Derived Xenograph Platforms. Before we begin discussing the content of the talk, I'd like to spend just a few moments describing who we are at the Jackson Laboratory. Our mission is to discover precise genomic solutions for disease and to empower the global biomedical community in the shared quest to improve human health. And we do this through a number of overlapping areas, really focusing on innovation. So the Jackson Laboratory is a not-for-profit scientific research organization, and our scientific expertise is derived directly from Jack's faculty and scientific researchers um, who are working on some of the most complex and pressing problems uh, relating to human genetics and disease. Um, and we're also focused on providing researchers around the world with cutting edge models as well as powerful preclinical services. In addition, we're extraordinarily passionate about scientific education uh, through such presentations as the one that you are joining us for today. Um, and so we're certainly happy to engage with you in any number of these areas uh, to promote and support your efforts. And so today, uh, in the course of this talk, uh, I'll spend some time first describing how Nod Skid Gamma or NSG mice are a powerful and useful platform for human disease research, particularly as it pertains to patient-derived xenograph models. Um, and then we'll spend some time demonstrating how PDX models can be used for predictive and preclinical research. And then lastly, uh, I'll spend a bit of time touching on immunologically humanized models for immuno-oncology applications. And then I'll also leave you with some resources um, on how to navigate um, genomic information, characterization information pertaining to uh, patient-derived xenograph models available from the Jackson Laboratory uh, PDX resource. So let's talk about broad context. Um, when we talk about the need for new preclinical models, uh, I think it's important to draw to the fore that only 5% of cancer treatments that enter clinical trials are eventually approved. And the major causes of attrition uh, of these um, uh, trial therapies is lack of efficacy and lack of suitable safety profile. And so what has been brought to the fore here is that use of more predictive models preclinically is going to be necessary to diminish attrition. And so that's where our discussion of patient-derived xenograph models uh, enters into uh, our discussion today. So first and foremost, when we begin to talk about PDX modeling, it's important to spend some time uh, beginning with the mouse that is used as the host strain for xenograph modeling. And so you're likely all very familiar with the nude mouse as a uh, long time uh, tool strain uh, for uh, oncology studies, a classic xenograph model. So here we see uh, a mouse that is homozygous for the FOXN1 nude mutation, uh, engrafted with the MCF7 breast cancer cell line. And you can see a palpable tumor that when treated with therapeutic regresses in an easily measurable format. Now, an important limitation to be well aware of here is that this model system is primarily effective um, when working with cancer cell lines, tumor cell lines that are easily grown in cell culture um, would be capable of growing in this model system. And the reason for that is several fold. So I'll go ahead and advance to the next slide. And here we see an overview of immunity in a very rudimentary sense. Um, I know for those of you that are uh, trained immunologists, this is a, a very rudimentary summarization, but it'll work for our purposes here today. 
So here we have our immune system comprised of the innate immune system, this more ancient first line uh, immune response, and the adaptive immune system. And then, of course, with cytokine crosstalking between the two. Now, in the context of our nude mouse, homozygous for the FOXN1 nude mutation, we see that the primary immunologic deficit is at the level of the T lymphocyte um, with crosstalk to the B lymphocytes as well. So the FOXN1 nude mutation actually functions um, in impaired uh, thymic follicular development. So uh, they're athymic and do not have functionally mature T cells. And then they also have impaired hair follicle formation leading to this nude phenotype. Um, but the key takeaway here is that um, much of the immune system remains intact in this particular model, uh, which does make it a not suitable host for engraftment of primary human uh, tissues, such as uh, primary human tumor samples or hematopoietic stem cells. And so that's where the NSG mouse, the nod skid gamma, enters into our conversation. So NSG is a highly immunodeficient mouse strain. We can see the full nomenclature shown here, the NOD or non-obese diabetic background, the PRKDC skid mutation, the interleukin-2 receptor gamma knockout mutation. Um, and all of these components are crucial for uh, resulting in this highly immunodeficient phenotype. So the NOD background, non-obese diabetic background, confers an absence of C5 hemolytic complement. Uh, these mice have reduced dendritic and NK cell function. They have defective macrophages. Um, I would highlight that they are defective, not absent. Uh, so that's something to be aware of there. And they do retain a more human-like SERP alpha allele on macrophages. So that's important uh, when you're engrafting things like hematopoietic stem cells. When SERP alpha interacts with CD47, uh, the SERP alpha allele, it will propagate an anti-phagocytic signal in this particular context. So the PRKDC skid mutation, or a severe combined immunodeficiency mutation, uh, functions to prevent double-stranded DNA uh, break repair, uh, which in the context of VDJ recombination prevents the development of functionally mature T and B cells. And then lastly, we have the interleukin-2 receptor gamma knockout mutation. And this is crucial in that it eliminates signaling from six distinct interleukins, uh, notably IL-15, which blocks natural killer cell development. Uh, and that's really crucial for engraftment uh, of a number of, of tissues, um, patient-derived xenograft, as well as hematopoietic stem cells um, for immunologic humanization. So taken together, we have these components that result in a profoundly immunodeficient mouse strain. So here we can see our schematic of the immune system components with nod, skid, gamma, or NSG mice. And we see a very different scenario uh, than what we saw when we looked at the same schematic for nude mice with impairments in adaptive immunity, impairments in innate immunity, as well as in cytokine crosstalk between the two. So how do we use this powerful tool as a platform for human disease research? Well, there are a number of applications and benefits. Uh, you may have encountered the concept of skid-associated leakiness, and that means uh, compensatory uh, T cell formation over time in some genetic backgrounds. We don't see that in NSG mice. They have a long lifespan, much longer than nod skid, greater than 16 months. Um, they don't develop thymic lymphomas like nod skid um, may have a uh, proclivity to do. They do have enhanced primary human tumor, as well as hematopoietic stem cell engraftment owing to that unique SERP alpha allele, making them valuable for immuno-oncology applications. There are a number of considerations that are crucial to keep in mind to support the successful use of NSG mice. And one is that they are profoundly immunodeficient. So they do require aseptic housing and handling to support their successful use. 
Um, as I mentioned, the PRKDC skid mutation functions to impair double-stranded DNA break repair, um, which does make these, these mice more radiation sensitive and more sensitive to genotoxic drugs. Um, they can be used, they just need to be titrated appropriately. So now that we have a fundamental understanding of the host strain that we're working with in regard to patient-derived xenograft modeling, um, let's go ahead and explore how PDX models are used for predictive and preclinical research. So I'd like to orient you to the JAX patient-derived xenograft program, the JAX PDX program. And so in this schematic, we see an overview uh, of how this program functions. First, we have um, material received directly from the clinic, primary patient tumor tissue, that would be engrafted into an initial NSG mouse, and this would be termed the P0 mouse. And that initial tumor that would come out of that P0 mouse uh, could go through a number of different routes. One, uh, some of that sample would be used for gene expression and copy number variant analysis. Some would be banked in our cryobank, and then some would be engrafted into a subsequent panel of NSG mice to expand that material out further, uh, what we would call the P1 our passage one material. And then that material that would come out of that P1 mouse would be archived in the cryobank. Now, a number of pieces of information are collected uh, on these tumor samples as they come into the JAX bank. Uh, we would have clinical information, uh, tumor type and grade and markers if that is available. We do maintain patient treatment history information uh, for the models in the JAX tumor bank. There also is histology that is performed, as well as gene expression and copy number variation analysis. Additionally, the JAX cancer treatment profile, a panel of uh, cancer associated genes is used for mutation analysis. So quite a lot of characterization uh, exists around these models to support model selection decisions uh, so that we can help researchers uh, select the appropriate tumor type, the appropriate tumor target, the appropriate profile uh, for their particular experimental question. All right, so how do we get to a cohort of mice to enroll on study? Well, we would come from our frozen tumor bank uh, to engraft material into what we would term donor mice. Again, these would be NSG mice engrafted with tumor uh, to expand that uh, available uh, tissue to engraft into subsequent NSG mice to establish a cohort of animals to enroll on your study. So this is a multi-step approach for the development of cohorts of patient-derived xenograft mouse models uh, for use on study. So there are about 400 different clinically relevant PDX tumors in the JAX model bank, and they are at a high degree of characterization. From a model breakdown point, we have well-established lung and colon tumor collections, uh, as well as high representation of triple negative breast tumors, as well as ER positive breast tumor models. We do also maintain two active prostate tumor models, and this is uh, historically a challenging tumor type to model from a PDX perspective. We also have made efforts to support the development of pediatric tumor models in support of the RACE Act here. All right, so let's begin to build on our story of you know, what PDX tumors look like in the context of the mouse. Uh, so let's start by speaking about histology and tumor tissue architecture. So here we're looking at data collected from Simpson Abelson, Journal of Immunology. Uh, and we can see a hematoxylin and eosin uh, image of a patient's lung tumor fragment. And then what we're looking at is uh, what that tissue looks like at the H&E level, as well as in regard to uh, presence of human cells, looking at anti-HLA, as well as looking at mouse blood cells. 
So when we look at the context of the H and E, we see that when this particular tumor is engrafted in the NSG mouse, you have much more faithful recapitulation of the histoarchitecture of that tumor fragment in the NSG versus engraftment in the CB17 skid, as we see here. Um, we also see that there is much higher uh, staining of human cells, anti-HLA, when we have engraftment in the NSG versus in the CB17 skin. And on the flip side, we see mm, fewer uh, mouse blood cells infiltrating the tumor in the NSG as compared to uh, staining uh, for mouse CD45 in the CB17 skin. So taken together, this supports that the, the fidelity of the patient uh, tumor uh, characteristic is maintained in the NSG mouse uh, to a high degree. And we can extend that even further uh, when we look at the patient tumor and the engrafted tumor, again, at the H&E level, and then also for uh, markers such as cytokeratins, as well as a proliferative index looking at KI67, we can see that there is significant similarity in the patient tumor as well as in the engrafted PDX in the NSG mouse here. So we can also expand to look at histoarchitecture, so the tissue morphology from the primary patient tumor to the initial P0 as well as the P1 passage. And so here we're looking at a colon adenocarcinoma carrying the KRAS G12 or G13D mutation. And we can see that this uh, crypt-like architecture is retained from the patient through the P0 and the P1 fragment, our P1 tumor sample. And we can also see that if we were to look at a colon adenocarcinoma that is metastatic to the lung, we see that histoarchitecture observed in the patient is recapitulated in the uh, patient tissue engrafted in the NSG mouse. So, We've established that histoarchitecture and H&E and histology is recapitulated in PDX tumors and grafted in NSG mice. But the next question that's important to uh, address is, do they respond to standard of care treatments? And so I'll walk you through a few examples of bladder PDX models in response to uh, single treatment, standard of care, uh, cisplatin. And so here we see our saline control in our black line, tumor volume on our y-axis, days on our x, and in the red, we have our cisplatin treatment group. Uh, there are a few things that I'd like to point out is that inherent to PDX models is heterogeneity as compared to working with cell line xenografts or CDX models, um, where we know that there is going to be heterogeneity. So experimental considerations, um, keeping this in mind, is that a larger sample size may be needed to produce a robust result. So in this particular bladder PDX model, we do see suppression of tumor growth in response to cisplatin therapy uh, versus the saline control. And so to illustrate further uh, that inherent to PDX modeling is heterogeneity within a particular model, so within it as well as between, uh, here we have a spider plot. So the same data that I presented on the previous slide, but here we're looking at individual curves for individual mice. And so what we see is a spider plot showing um, treatment with cisplatin, and in red, we see mice that are tumors that are relatively resistant to cisplatin, able to grow despite therapy. And in the blue, we see a mouse uh, with sensitivity to cisplatin, and in the black, we see somewhat of an intermediate response. So it's important to uh, be well aware that this variability may exist and that the variability may be more reflective of human tumors and facilitate studies of drug resistance. 
All right, so let's switch gears and have a look at data for a different bladder tumor model. So the tumor growth rate in response to therapy is expected to vary by model. So here we can compare uh, the response to cisplatin in this particular model, TM00015, versus what we saw in the previous example, TM00016. Uh, so what we see is that the curves look quite a bit different. We see slower growth in the untreated saline control, um, and we do see uh, suppression of tumor growth with cisplatin treatment, um, but the curves themselves do look different. So it's important to bear this in mind and consider screening more than one tumor type uh, per, uh, or tumor model per cancer type. Okay, so now I'd like to present to you uh, an example of uh, how we can design experiments to examine test article response in models with different genomic profiles. So uh, as I illustrated in our description of the JAX uh, PDX uh, pipeline to develop models, we do uh, characterize at the genomic level uh, for gene expression, for variants, copy number variants, and we can use that data uh, to allow for models that meet a particular criteria as far as their molecular characteristics to be identified and used on study. So here we can see an example of about 125 non-small cell lung carcinoma tumors, and we can see that models are selected uh, based upon their molecular assessment. Um, and so here we can see selecting models with activated EGFR mutations uh, and known differences in drug sensitivities. So, um, you know, a wild type or a non-EGFR variant annotated versus activating variants that are annotated um, and different resistances, either sensitive, acquired resistance or de novo resistance. Um, and then you can uh, use that characterization information uh, and study response to different treatment regimens. Uh, so we can use that uh, to generate a robust experimental design uh, to be executed, depending on a particular question. I'd like to spend a little bit of time speaking about modeling breast cancer, uh, PDX. So importantly, NSG mice can support the growth of estrogen receptor positive breast tumors. And we know that this has historically been a challenge. So we see here uh, in the IHC images for estrogen receptor in a PDX model in the JAX Bank TM00386, that we have a positive staining in the patient tumor and that positive staining is retained out to passage five in the PDX model. We also see that tumors can retain this organoid growth pattern. Importantly, supplemental estradiol is used to promote estrogen receptor positive tumor growth and NSG mice are relatively resistant to estradiol induced bladder toxicity uh, versus other host strains. So again, we can see when we look at histology uh, that we have retention of an organoid type growth pattern in the patient tumor as well as the P0 and P1 tumor uh, that would come from uh, come out of NSG mice here. So the next question is, can we use gene expression and molecular characterization to predict therapeutic response? And so here I'll illustrate a, an example using non-small cell lung carcinoma, uh, drug susceptibility based upon gene, gene expression. So the model that we're looking at here is TM00186. And in this particular model, we're looking at uh, a KRAS G12C variant no EGFR variant annotated and classification of ERK1 low. So based upon that gene expression and variant information, we predict because there's no EGFR variant annotated that the model would be resistant to erlotinib, the tyrosine kinase inhibitor erlotinib, and sensitive to cisplatin um, owing to ERK1 low. Um, so let's go ahead and have a look at experimental data based upon these predictions. 
And so what we do see is, again, if we're looking at tumor volume on the y-axis, treatment on the, or days on the x, we see that the vehicle control group um, was able to grow quite robustly. And that response to erlotinib in the blue line did not suppress tumor growth much below what we see in the vehicle control, but we do have suppression of tumor growth in response to cisplatin. So the takeaway here is that our gene expression analysis uh, and predictions based upon gene expression and variant analysis is informed uh, and is uh, borne out when we look at experimental results. Let's take that one step further here and have a look at uh, TM00199 and acquired tyrosine kinase inhibitor resistance. So what we see in this schematic is uh, the area under the curve is representative of patient tumor burden over time. And so this particular patient was initiated with first line chemotherapy and unfortunately um, tumor uh, burden progressed and erlotinib therapy was started with response as we see here. And then unfortunately we see tumor growth reinitiated um, on erlotinib. And at that point in time, a sample was collected that the PDX model was established from. And unfortunately, we see continued growth in the particular patient. Um, and then with a combination therapy of a fatinib and cetuximab, we do begin to see, or uh, we do see suppression of tumor growth. So the question is, uh, can we take a tumor, a PDX tumor, taken from a patient at a time of uh, acquired TKI resistance and study that in the context of a mouse? And so here, if we take TM00199, graft an NSG, and treat uh, with vehicle, uh, again, tumor volume uh, days, uh, our vehicle is able to grow quite well. And we see progression uh, on erlotinib therapy uh, in, in line with what is observed in the patient. And we see suppression of tumor growth in response to a fatinib cetuximab and a fatinib plus cetuximab. So the treatment response fidelity is maintained in this example between the patient and the passage PDX model. I'd next like to offer up a pretty interesting publication uh, and I highly recommend uh, that you access the PubMed ID and review the full text of the publication. Uh, this is the Science Reports um, a publication from 2018 with Jack's researcher Jeff Chong as the primary author and in this particular experiment uh, PDX material from two different patients was used and the idea was to uh, to, to investigate intratumoral heterogeneity in a very precise and detailed way. So quantitative assessment was performed of intratumoral heterogeneity across these two patient samples uh, with and without treatment. So treatment with doxorubicin, cyclophosphamide, cisplatin, and docetaxel. And then within those tumor samples, treated and untreated, exome seq as well as digital droplet PCR for copy number and allele frequency was performed to assess uh, subclones within the tumors um, over different passages as well. And so what we see in this particular experiment, of which there is a lot of really interesting data, uh, we see that tumor subclones did have, in, in one particular model, have differential chemotherapy sensitivity, um, where tumor volume change in response to cisplatin was proportional to the post-treatment ratio uh, of the subclones that were identified. So a very interesting publication uh, that I highly recommend for you to delve into here. All right, so next up, I'd like to review immunologically humanized models for immuno-oncology applications. 
So here is the paradigm by which we can establish what we call our OncoHue platform, or one of the ways that this can be established. And, and these are changing with complexity all the time. In this particular example, we see an NSG or an NSG variant, such as the NSG SGM3, that is engrafted with uh, human cord blood derived CD34 positive hematopoietic stem cells uh, following sublethal after sublethal irradiation to um, give these engrafted HSCs a competitive competitive advantage home to the bone marrow niche undergo multi lineage uh, differentiation and give rise to an immunologically humanized mouse to study you know a human like immune system in the context of a mouse so we can take this validated humanized mouse and in graft, either a PDX tumor um, or a cell line uh, xenograft into this particular model. And what that allows us to arrive at is a mouse that carries a human-like immune system uh, as well as a human tumor. And that model system can be interrogated for a number of immuno-oncology applications. Um, and I will say the number of NSG variant strains that exists is growing all the time and what that allows for is targeted use of different strains that support the engraftment of different immune cell populations depending on your needs so for example the NSG IL-15 transgenic strain when engrafted with CD34 positive hematopoietic stem cells uh, has physiologically relevant levels of human NK cells in the system uh, if NK cell therapies are of interest to the work that you are doing so a number of different Different platforms that can be used um, to arrive at our uh, our platforms for immuno-oncology study. So the first question uh, when JAX investigators went to study uh, PDX growth um, or PDX tumors in the context of uh, humanized NSG mice was to first ask pretty simple questions about growth rate. Um, and so here we're looking at three different PDX models, a lung, a breast, and a soft tissue carcinoma model, uh, engrafted in, in, in humanized NSG mice in the pink line and NSG mice in the green line. And this is a published study. Again, you can access the PubMed ID should you wish to look into this in more detail, published by investigators at JAX. And I will note that the HLA uh, matching between the HSC donor and the PDX tumor was partial or full. Um, and that what we see here is that growth kinetics that have been observed or are observed in non-humanized NSG mice uh, are quite similar to what we see in the context of the humanized NSG mice. And this is the case in most scenarios, though I will say not all. So PDX growth kinetics should certainly be tested for each model before enrolling in a uh, large study using this system. We also know that there is variability in co-engraftment and therapeutic response depending on the CD34 positive HSC donor that is used. So using several CD34 positive HSC donors per experiment is certainly something that should be considered. Uh, we typically are looking at three donors or more depending on goals of an experiment. So here we can look at an example uh, of uh, a particular experiment that was done where uh, Keytruda as well as cisplatin can inhibit the growth of uh, breast tumor model that we see here, TM00098, in the context of CD34 positive humanized NSG mice. So again, we're looking at tumor bearing um, humanized NSG mice and asking if they respond to standard of care therapies, uh, which we can see in our graph shown here, uh, that indeed in our green line showing cisplatin treatment, we see suppression of tumor growth. 
Uh, we also ask the question, can humanized mice respond to checkpoint inhibitors? And they do so in a donor-dependent fashion, an HSC donor-dependent fashion. So again, Keytruda is a checkpoint inhibitor that's going to impede the PD-1, PD-L1 interaction um, and allow for T cells to continue to um, act and uh, remove the inhibitory signal on those T cells. And so in this particular example, what we do see is a suppression of tumor growth in response to Keytruda. I will say that it is um, known to be something that is donor dependent. And also the response is likely allogeneic as the CD34 positive HSC and PDX donors are different. Um, but again, this is just a nice encapsulation as an example uh, of some of the types of questions that you can ask in this particular model system. And of course, there are a number of other immuno-oncology agents um, that could potentially be uh, assessed in these paradigms by specific T cell engagers, et cetera. All right, so the last section that I'd like to spend some time on today uh, is to orient you to uh, different tools to search through PDX models available from JAX, um, including assessing the genomic characterization uh, that we have available for PDX models. And I would like to highlight another publication recent uh, from researchers here at JAX, uh, Wu et al., a 2019 BMC Medical Genomics, uh, walking us through workflows for uh, genomic analysis for tumors uh, from PDX models. And it's really important to bear in mind that well-designed and robust workflows for assessing PDX genomic data are absolutely required. Uh, these workflows must be able to distinguish between human and mouse reads and must be able to identify somatic mutations and copy number variations in the absence of paired non-tumor samples from the same patient. So having a well-defined and robust workflow is really key when looking to get uh, genomic characterization information from patient-derived xenograft platforms. So let me walk you through a little bit of that. So we have a platform developed um, that you can access a whole host of information, um, including the mouse models of human cancer database hosted through the mouse genome informatics database uh, that we see here. And it's on the mouse models of human cancer uh, database that you can begin to explore different PDX models available in the JAX collection uh, that you may wish to bring in to use for your experiments. And you can search through a number of different modalities. The PDX model ID, if you happen to know it, or you can search by primary tumor sites, um, toggling to include models where we may have dosing study information, or from uh, established from patients that are known to be treatment naive or categorized as treatment naive. We can uh, limit to models that uh, are reflective of triple negative breast cancer. Um, we can also search by specific diagnoses or annotated gene variants um, or gene expression, as well as copy number variants here. So a number of different ways uh, that models can be searched upon. And then once you have established a search, so here we're looking at models that carry the triple negative breast cancer tag. So this would be from uh, established from patients that were diagnosed with triple negative breast cancer. Um, we can see that we return 30 matching PDX models. And then what we can also identify at a glance is diagnosis, initial and final, um, the tumor site, primary tumor site, as well as the tumor type, if it was a primary malignancy or metastasis, um, information about the patient, as well as uh, an at-a-glance view of additional information or additional data that may be available, such as dosing study information uh, or histology annotated to the model detail pages. So if we are to look at a model detail page, what you'll see is um, a synopsis uh, a, a number of things. First, we would see, um, you know, an overview of uh, model details, an overview of patient information, 
uh, as well as uh, different aspects of tumor mutation burden, microsatellite instability, um, et cetera. And then what we can further do is expand individual model detail pages uh, to look at annotated genetic variants. To expand uh, our variant poll, you can look at gene expression information across a number of platforms uh, that may be present, as well as explore copy number variation, uh, as well as plots for CNV. So if we are to look at our gene expression profile, as we see an example of data shown here, uh, we can see a couple of different platforms, RNA-seq as well as microarray, um, and a key uh, accordingly to that. Uh, we can see gene expression here, um, and be aware that only a subset of genes uh, in our JAK's cancer treatment profile would show up in this visualization. Uh, but if at any point in time you are reviewing PDX models in the JAK's collection and your particular gene of interest is not present, you just simply need to reach out to us and we can work with our PDX informatics team to access the information for you. And uh, we'd be happy to provide that to you. We also have uh, information available that can be quite helpful as part of the variant summary and the JAX clinical knowledge base or CKB. And so what we can see is information about the variant, the variant effect, a predicted protein effect, as well as annotations regarding predicted sensitivity or predicted drug resistance. There may also be information regarding potential treatment approaches um, in addition to platform used to assess the variant um, and information about amino acid changes, et cetera. Uh, so the JAX clinical knowledge base that you can access here offers a, a wealth of information uh, about tying actionable variants uh, with information uh, from our PDX models. So it's another great place to look for, uh, for additional information and characterization about PDX tumors in the JAX bank. Additionally, we have growth characteristics and response to standard of care treatments uh, for many models in the collection. So here we see uh, an example showing tumor volume in response to docetaxel, cisplatin, cyclophosphamide, as well as doxorubicin. Um, you can also access information about study design uh, as well as dosing strategies um, for these different experiments that are annotated. So this can be a really powerful uh, way to to design your own studies, understand a little bit more about how the models have been characterized, and really support your successful use of the models in the JAX bank. And so with that, I'd like to uh, draw to a close here uh, and share that PDX models indeed more closely recapitulate clinical observations than other models that have been used historically. Uh, we see gene expression, tumor structure, and treatment response uh, being uh, retaining fidelity from the patient through to the engrafted PDX tissue. We also see that low passage samples, so low passage number samples, retain heterogeneity and fidelity of human cancers. I hope I've also clearly illustrated that characterization data are available for you to guide your model selection decisions. Uh, and what we are continually working to do are is to pair um, PDX tumors or other tumor models with immunologically humanized mice for immuno-oncology applications. Um, and we would be happy to speak with you in more detail about any of these areas. And so with that, uh, I'd like to just briefly orient you to the number of areas that JAX would love to engage with you. Um, and this is in regard to making sure that you have access to precise models uh, and scientific expertise. Uh, we can do this through model access, our mouse models, uh, as well as custom model generation, uh, our PDX tumors and tissue bank, as well as uh, validation of your target and characterization um, 
depending on your needs. We also offer uh, preclinical solutions. So we, we actually work with uh, running efficacy studies using PDX models on a regular basis um, in our in vivo pharmacology group. And we'd be certainly happy to engage with you on that if it will help your needs. And I very much appreciate your time and attention today. Uh, I would be happy to speak with you about any questions that you may have. Uh, you can reach out to me at micetech at jax.org. That will reach the technical information services team. And if you'd like to speak to me directly about the content of the talk or any other questions, please feel free to draw attention to Grace and that email inquiry will certainly reach me. We're also available by phone. Uh, if, if that is workable for your time schedule, please do feel free to call us at any point in time. We're always glad to help um, and we'd love to engage with you further.